Okay, good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, connecting to this class. We are learning so much from the book of Hebrews. So today will be another day. Let's see how far we can go. Let's pray and get started. Would anyone be able to unmute and pray, please? Shall we pray? Yes. Dear Father, I want to say thank you this morning. Thank you because you are faithful. You are kind. You are good. Thank you for all the force present now. Thank you for what you are doing all over the world by reaching out to the world with your word. Thank you for using us all as a tool, as a instrument. Be that glorified in the name of Jesus. Lord, we commit today's activities, today's lecture into your hands. Please, Lord, grant us a heart to receive in the name of Jesus and grant us the, the very best memory in the name of Jesus. Above all, O oh Lord, please, Lord, prepare us for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Success. Um, so we get back into Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. So uh, let's look at Hebrews 2 verse 14. We see that the Lord Jesus, having partaken of flesh and blood, meaning becoming human, did something for us, and that is to die for us and dying what it was meant to do is to destroy the power of the devil and i wanted to let us know uh, that as believers this is a great hope which we carry in first corinthians chapter 15 paul talks about it he says that if we don't have the hope of rising up again after death then we are pitiable then uh, just you know, more than other other people out there in the world. But because we carry this hope of resurrection, uh, it really makes our faith so alive. And even in the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, there Paul encourages uh, people who may have lost their loved ones. And he says that they are but asleep. You know, they are going to rise again. They're going to come back with the Lord Jesus when he returns. And that is incredible. That may never have been possible unless Jesus died for us. So this verse 14 is telling us that Jesus has done something. He has destroyed the one who has the power of death, and that is the devil. So Jesus has overcome the devil. Jesus has dealt with death. Now, one of the other struggles that mankind has is the fear of death. Um, it's never a good thing for us to think of death because it, it seems like the end and it is if we don't have faith excuse me in the lord jesus christ and therefore for us as believers right we need to settle in our hearts that jesus has defeated the devil who uh, has brought about death and he has released us from the fear of death. So verse 15 here, it says, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So that's a great hope that we have in Christ. Uh, and Jesus, through his humanity, has accomplished this for us. Now we can go on. It says, for indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. So what does God do? God gives help or he supplies um, his care and favor to people. And us, he's more specifically, it says, seed of Abraham. Who are the seed of Abraham? We who believe in the book of Galatians, we notice that, that though um, naturally Abraham has his own descendants, what the writer here is talking about is that he, he, is, he is referring to the believers. So we are the spiritual seed of Abraham. So God gives help favor uh, and uh, support to us believers verse 17 therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god we talked about the humanity of jesus and uh, 
why did Jesus had to become a human? One is to defeat the devil who had the power of death. Secondly, to identify. Uh, in Christology, we talk about these things, you know, substitution, identification. So the Lord Jesus became one of us. He became like us. That is why he's able to call us his brethren. Okay, So that's why the term brethren, because he became like us. And that also enabled him to be a merciful and a faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. A high priest was always chosen as a representative of the people. So he must be one among the people. He can't be an outsider. Secondly, he must be familiar with uh, what the people are going through so that he can represent them well and carry their concerns. Now, when we look at the Lord Jesus becoming a man, he did both of these things for us. Firstly, he became a man. So he was one among us. He was our brethren. Secondly, we understand that uh, he experiencing humanity and the challenges of humanity, he could have that merciful attitude towards us. And he became a merciful and a faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. So he is with God now. He's interceding for us. We know he's up in heaven right now at the right hand of the Father. He has done his work of intercession you know, on the cross for us. Uh, and in these ways, the Lord Jesus has become our high priest. And it also says, make propitiation for the sins of the people. So later on, we'll see. There are so many uh, roles that we can attribute to the Lord Jesus. Here, one is high priest. We said that he's the high priest. But also, uh, notice it says propitiation for the sins of the people. Later, we'll see how exactly he did it. He also became a sacrifice for us. So he's a high priest. And he also became the sacrifice. Um, and it's really beautiful to discover all that the Lord Jesus is and all that he does for us. And again, in verse 18, a reminder that uh, the Lord Jesus represents us uh, really well. And more than that, he is an overcomer. He's left a pattern for us and he's become our example. Because verse 18 says, for in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. So because he went through the challenges that we go through today, he knows. You know, we can't look at Jesus and say, uh, Jesus, you don't understand. Because he does. Has he been through temptation um, that that may have sort of, you know, uh, give, uh, allured him to give up his purpose? Yes. Uh, has he gone through uh, opposition, accusing words of people that brought discouragement? Yes. Okay, worldly lusts coming after him and, uh, you know, sort of asking him to live life in a completely different way. Yes. Right. So these are the things that we face today. We, uh, Satan wants us to quit. Satan wants us to be distracted. Satan wants us to be discouraged. But when we look at the life of Jesus, he was fully man. And uh, the Bible says that he went through everything that we went through. And that is why he's such a perfect high priest for us. He was tempted. And thus, he can aid us. Okay, so he's the best representative as the high priest. Because he knows what we are talking about. And he knows you know, uh, what we need to be able to overcome those temptations. So it's really encouraging for us to know that the Lord Jesus, being fully God, he rules and reigns, but he loved us so much that he became a man. He became our substitute. He identified with humanity, and therefore he became a very merciful and a faithful high priest for us. And he himself, having suffered, being tempted, he now is able to help us who are tempted. Okay, So we can look to Jesus 
and find help in our moments of temptation. Any thoughts or questions regarding what we've discussed so far? Because uh, we can then move on to Hebrews chapter 3. Okay, I see a question here in the chat where Jeffina says, he might destroy him who had the power of death. Does it talk about literal death or being spiritually dead? Uh, I believe it's referring to both. Both. Yeah. Any any other queries about the humanity of Jesus? Okay, I suppose we need to really think about these things further. Uh, and if you come up with questions later, that's also fine. So let's proceed. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 3. Let's uh, read from verses 1 through 6, and then we will look at the following portion. So could somebody turn to Hebrews 3, please, uh, verses 1 to 6? Chapter 3, verses 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So here coming to Hebrews chapter 3, it's in continuation to the exaltation of Jesus. Even in speaking about the humanity of Jesus, all he's saying is that he is God, who has fulfilled the mandate of saving us. And uh, he is exalting the Lord Jesus as God. Now he comes to uh, addressing the believers. And notice how he addresses them. So he uses some terms like holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And then he says, you know, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Christ Jesus. So, so beautiful. Who we are in Christ is who we truly are. And the author addresses the believers in this way. He knows what has happened to the believers. Now that the Lord Jesus has redeemed us, he already mentioned it. We who are being sanctified. Remember, he said that. But with that in mind, he actually states that the believers are holy. And of course, brethren. So holy brethren, that's our position in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And he says, partakers of the heavenly calling. So, excuse me, every blessing that God has for us in Christ that has been given to us okay and we are partakers of the heavenly calling uh, which means you know our mandate on earth our mandate that will continue in heaven all of that is in christ and uh, uh, 
we we are we are participants of what christ has done for us and we've been positioned in christ um and you know just the whole identity aspect of what has happened to the believers so it's really wonderful to know that in times of difficulty one of the important reminders that we need is who we are in christ these believers they're going through persecution and challenges and in those moments the author is exalting the lord jesus and he's also reminding the believers don't forget who you are uh, it's not just about this natural life that we live but there's a greater life which we have in christ jesus and don't forget that uh, person that you and i have become in christ jesus holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling and then he says one of the things that uh, needs correction is our focus uh, especially when we go through challenging times so he talks to the believers and says consider consider so what is he saying he's saying your mind is filled with all these these things that you're worried about and you're you know wondering about and confused about anxious about okay let that be shift your focus consider look at something that i will talk about right now who is the lord jesus but how does he describe the lord jesus okay another aspect to who jesus is earlier we saw merciful faithful high priest okay jesus our brother these were some themes that he was um uh, picking up now he's saying consider that word consider apparently like the greek meaning of that word is fix your attention okay katanoin is is that greek word fix your attention on the apostle so another term apostle and high priest of our confession christ jesus so he is the sent one apostle simply means sent one um we know that god sent his only begotten son and that is who he's talking about the lord jesus our apostle and high priest of our confession so high priest of our confession simply means that you know jesus stands in agreement to uh what what we say aligned with the word of god so the lord jesus obviously because the word uh, he himself is the word so when we speak aligned to the word of god uh, he is our apostle and our high priest of the confession that we make so he backs it up who was faithful to him who appointed him so this is something for us to remember whenever we make confession aligned to the word of god remember is there anyone to back it up is there anyone who says amen to it is there anyone who agrees with it the lord jesus himself he is the apostle and high priest of our confession what is confession confession is agreeing to the word of god he stands behind that and uh, you know we will see the fulfillment of god's word in our lives so keep declaring the word of god keep holding on to the truth of god's word keep holding on to the promises of god because god himself stands behind it and he has become our apostle and our high priest uh, and he uh, the writer goes on to say that jesus one of the qualities about jesus is he was faithful to god and the mandate that god gave him and now he will talk a little bit about moses even about moses he says that this man moses he was faithful uh in all his house so he's talking about the household of god uh the people of god whom moses took care of and among those people moses was very very faithful now why is he suddenly bringing in moses we may have that question he's probably talking about moses because he's addressing a jewish crowd and for the jewish people uh the patriarchs of the faith people like abraham moses jacob they all carried great honor uh and uh, like they were they were they were the ones um 
that they revered so much. So now he is trying to let them know that Jesus is greater than all of these patriarchs, even Moses, whom they considered as this great leader and deliverer who brought them out of um, their, their troubles you know, back in Egypt and through the wilderness years. He says, look, Moses, he was definitely faithful in all his house. But in verse 3, he says, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. So he's reminding them, give Christ Jesus the rightful position. He's greater than your Moses. We do appreciate Moses, but Jesus is greater. And then he makes a comparison. He, uh, he uh, describes something like a house. And he says that, uh, you know, we honor those who work hard to build the house. But ultimately, uh, who is the one, you know, who, who needs the greatest honor? It is the one to whom that home belongs, right? He's the one who, uh, the one who is in charge of that home. So he is saying that the Lord Jesus uh, is the son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So Moses was something like a worker in the house, but the Lord Jesus is the son of the house himself. So once again, just bringing the attention of the believers to the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. So why is he you know, continuously pointing back to Christ? Um, I feel like you know two things that we've picked up so far. In a period of discouragement, reminding people of who our God is, who Jesus is, and reminding them of who they are in Christ. Okay, uh, that might serve as not just an encouragement, but also lead them to worship from where they can draw their strength. From where um, you know they can they can overcome the the many things that may be trying to bog them down or push them down. So that's why he's going on this mode, and he never stops warning the people. Remember, early on in uh, Hebrews chapter two, he said, "Do not neglect." Okay, don't 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 let go of this faith because there will be consequences. So once again, he comes back to that warning mode and tells them to not let go of their faith. So as we read these passages, you know, not just uh, the book of Hebrews, I think any book of the Bible, one of the tendencies which we have is to go through the passages and imagine that they are for somebody else. Okay, that I will never go through this, or I can't relate to, oh, uh, are there people who dis get discouraged and want to let go of their uh, journey with God, their faith? But it'll never, I'm not that person. You know, we, we tend to do that. But uh, it's good to see what people have gone through and uh, to just strengthen ourselves so that whenever we go through uh, anything in our lives that might bring us to these positions, at least we know, right, that, uh, hey, there is this possibility. I must never find myself in that place. I must not. Uh, we, we talked about drifting away and how it happens so subtly and slowly. Uh, but it can happen to anyone if we are not careful. So every message in the Bible, uh, there is something that it has got to do with me and the way God is preparing me and strengthening me. So as we read about the people of Israel, we are going to read about them. It's very easy for us to look at it and say, oh, they were very rebellious. You know, their hearts were unbelieving. But it's good to reflect about our own lives and say, God, you know, do you find rebellion anywhere? Do you find unbelief anywhere? And uh, if so, help me, Lord, to never put myself in the position that these scriptures are talking about. So that's where we're going to right now, where he will begin to warn us with the example of the children of Israel and how uh, they were careless with their faith. So let's read from verse 7 till verse 11. So we'll explain that passage and then go further. Anyone can unmute and read, please. Verse 
Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Amen. Okay, so it starts with a therefore. Therefore is a connecting word. Because Christ is so great, right? Greater than the angels. He has sacrificed himself, become our merciful, faithful high priest, apostle and high priest of our confession. Therefore, because he's so great, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, yes, yeah, the Holy Spirit says, meaning um, he, he's talking about what is on God's heart for us. Now, why is he suddenly saying Holy Spirit says? Now we all know what uh, the word of God, what of God says is what the Holy Spirit agrees with. So whether it's the Holy Spirit says or the written word, um, anyone in the Trinity who's speaking to us, it is God speaking to us. So God says, so through all this, God is saying something. What is he saying? Today, if you hear, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So he's talking to the believers and he's saying, look, God is trying to say something through all of this. To stand back up, live for the purposes of God, keep moving forward, Okay, be strong in the Lord, know who God is, know who we are in Christ. All this is what the Holy Spirit is saying. But when he's speaking, one thing that we need from our sides is a correct response. So he tells the believers, when the Spirit of God is speaking to us in this way, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now we know how the children of Israel were time to time. You know, they were people who uh, did not appreciate God's blessings. So they complained, they grumbled, uh, they they did not trust God. So, you know, they were questioning and uh, uh, they, they were making Moses's life difficult. Uh, they were disobedient, they were rebellious. So all these qualities are attributed to those people. Today, we can ask the question, you know, are there any challenges that can harden our hearts? What do you think? We as believers, are there some things that can harden our hearts in our walk with the Lord? And what are some of those things? Murmuring. Okay, murmuring against God, no? Murmuring, okay, like, why God? Why should I do all this? Something like that. So we are complaining, murmuring against God. Anything else that could harden our hearts, which has the tendency to? Not being patient. Okay, okay, not being patient. That's good. What else? Pretending to love God. Pretending. Okay. Pretending. Pretending to love God. Okay. Sure. How about pride? Pride also could sort of harden. Keeping malice. And keeping keeping malice. malice. Okay. Okay. Keeping malice. Cheating. 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 Okay. Con convertiousness. Spirit of convertiousness. Okay. All kinds of evil, fleshly things. When we give place to fleshly things in our lives, that can bring a hard heart. Okay. So that sounds quite dangerous, isn't it? A hard heart. 
if if we carry a hard heart as a believer uh how how i mean how how do you think that that will affect us i'm a believer but i have a hard heart please come back i can't hear you clearly sorry no i'm saying if one is a believer and they have a hard heart right so how do, uh, how would it uh, affect uh, them uh, um, number one number one if someone had this heart he can never receive message from god mm. because god will never speak to such person mm. even if god is speaking because he has he or she had his heart he will not know that this is god speaking because the heart is already heard it. Mm. even when god is warning him or her he will not even concerned about it because number one if you had your eye you will not be in the spirit and god is in the spirit mm -hmm. yeah thank you success for uh, sharing your thoughts so yes one of the biggest uh, dangers is us not being able to recognize the voice of god uh, and the writer here somewhat he's speaking in that context only he says if you hear his voice today then don't harden your hearts okay maybe by not hearing the voice of god regularly one can come to this place of having a hard heart that even when god speaks we're not able to hear what god is saying so uh, a hard heart it can develop due to many reasons we said uh, fleshly manner of life can cause that to happen where we are living in sin and uh, we are denying that we are living in sin we just continue you know just uh, sort of in a in a bold way continuing in sin that creates a heart we are not responding to the convictions of the holy spirit uh, with a tender heart a, a tender heart in contrast is a soft heart that is responsive to every word that god says every small thing that the spirit of god ministers to us we are quick to respond and say oh okay god you know i repent or um, uh, i believe or i will do we walk in obedience with a tender heart but a hard heart is one which which you know proceeds in its own way uh, and uh, is not very sensitive to what god's voice is saying now how can this happen uh, one is yielding to our freshly desires and uh, next would be unbelief which we will look at in this passage so primarily uh, when it comes to the children of israel their problem was unbelief okay they were constantly in unbelief they didn't trust god they didn't they didn't want to uh, say yes to god the way people like moses did right and they did not want to encounter god deeply the way moses did so it is very unfortunate because they they went on in unbelief which uh, made god angry uh, and uh, yeah so just two things that, that i've said here but hardness of heart can also come uh, due to discouragement maybe that is why the author is addressing this particular crowd uh, regarding hardness of heart because when one goes through challenges after challenges but they don't look to god in in the midst of those challenges you know they may feel like what is happening you know why is god not uh, answering why is god not ministering uh, maybe god is angry with me maybe god is not listening to me so okay fine i don't i don't think i will continue with what god wants me to do so even uh, challenges discouragements struggles if we are not careful they can make our heart very hard so uh, in the very verse there you know end of verse 7 the writer uses a beautiful word uh, would you like to take a guess what that word is verse 7 yeah today if you hear his voice so any word there that stands out for us 
I think Jeffina said today. Perfect. Today. So that's beautiful because he's teaching us how to have a tender heart before God. And that is by responding now. Respond immediately. Don't push it off for tomorrow. And say, okay, you know, God, Holy Spirit is speaking to me about this. I'll look into it when I feel better. Or I'll look into it you know, when I have the time. That is the dangerous part. Never postpone uh, when the Holy Spirit is convicting us and speaking to us. If he's asking us to deal with it, we need to deal with it right away. So today, if you hear his voice, respond immediately. When God speaks, there needs to be a worship, a, a reverent response to what God is speaking. And that's our takeaway today, that God help us to respond immediately. Help us not to risk you know, having a hard heart. Now, when we look at the children of Israel here, he says they uh, had hardened their hearts in the rebellion uh, and the day of trial in the wilderness, where the fathers tested me, tried me, saw my works 40 years. It's so sad that God even has to explain this. He had done so many miracles for them. But what was their response? Testing God, trying God. How far can we go? You know, how much can we push? Where is the boundary line? Okay, let's try it. Till we can get away uh, in, in, you know, within, within these things, let's get away with whatever we are doing. So they were just trying and testing God. And look what God says. They saw my works 40 years. If we see miracles worth 40 years, see with your eyes, Red Sea is parting, mana is falling. Imagine, like, how should our response be towards God? But it's so sad to note that though they had seen many miracles, they did not understand God. So sad. But let's not just leave it on that generation. Maybe today, in our time and season, we are experiencing and encountering God, but we are behaving the same way. We know the works of God. We've experienced the works of God. But we test and try God. And uh, we, are, we have hearts of unbelief. We have hard hearts. We don't respond immediately. These are things that uh, really will put us in a position of risk, which is what the writer is trying to say. Uh, and he's saying that, because those people, they were like that. What? What? Uh, how did God respond to them? Verse 10, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So sad. Everything was done in front of them, but still they went astray in their heart. Focus was not upon the Lord. Focus was somewhere else. And secondly, they did not understand God, his heart. They just saw all his activities and that was that. But it, it didn't go deeper than that. So it's really a lesson for us in our generation to carry that soft heart before the Lord that would respond immediately and keep ourselves free from worldliness, ungodliness, um, uh, and uh, you know, like discouragement uh, and uh, many of the other things that we talked about. And Again, notice he says, go astray in their heart. So we've talked about the power of the mind and uh, the importance of having a renewed mind as a believer. So that's the starting point of seeing breakthroughs. For us, if we are careless in the area of our mind, in the area of our heart, see, he, he doesn't talk about actions first, but he says, go astray in their hearts. So that one small thing, you know, that is taking us away from God. Did God really say it was just a thought that Satan planted in Eve's mind? But that thought led to the fall because they took action on that thought. So similarly, he says, they go astray in their heart. Even for us, keeping our heart, what we believe uh, right is so very important. Uh, and when we are careful about our strengthening our minds with the word of God and uh, 
you know, being rooted and grounded in the word of God, uh, it's not so easy to go astray in our hearts. So it's a warning. And we can keep our hearts in the word of God and know God. And uh, unfortunately, you know, these people, they were rebellious and God was angry with them. And uh, it also says that he swore that they shall not enter the rest of God. So we'll talk about the rest of God when we uh, meet in the next class. So at this point, we will wrap up. Any thoughts before we close for today? All right. So if there are none, let's uh, pray and close. I want to request someone to please unmute and pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class that we had. But we thank you for being our high priest and our sacrifice. And God, today if we hear your voice, Jesus, help us to respond to it. Help us to listen to it. Help us to uh, walk in your ways and to be as your children who is immediately responding as Samuel did. God, we say here we are, Jesus, right now. That every truth that we learn, God, uh, be imprinted in our hearts so that we will never ever drift away from it. But God, we will always uh, live as the partakers of the creator calling uh, the one who is called we will always remember our worth in you and god we will glory keep glorifying you on this life i give all my classmates into your hands i bless them all in the name of jesus give pastor nancy into your hands thank you for everything that she's teaching to us god thank you god for filling her with complete health in the upcoming days in jesus name i pray amen Amen. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. And please do join us uh, online uh, for the Christian Leaders Conference, which is starting tomorrow. So really look forward to having you all on the live stream. So those who can connect, we will, we've will. we already posted details on the main Audi. We'll probably post it um, on the class courses as well. But please join us. Okay, so there'll be no classes from tomorrow uh, through the week. We'll get back into the regular classes from next Monday. Okay, thank you. Bye for now. God bless. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Ma. Oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Ma.